Um, for the acoustics that we are hearing in speech, we really know that they can be broken down into three main categories. There's the frequency of the sound, how high or how low it is. There's the intensity of sound, how loud or how soft it is. And there's the duration of sound, how long or how short it is. There's lots and lots of words and lots and lots of speech sounds that are different only in terms of one or two acoustic features. And so obviously those acoustic features are really important. This is your dad, you know. Um, you are bad. Those are very similar words. Um, they mean completely different things, but they really only differentiate bad and dad are completely the same, except at the very onset, whether you put your mouth together, your lips together at the front or at the hard palate. Bad, dad, and acoustically, they're almost identical. The whole word is identical, except for about the first 30 or 40 milliseconds. So how does this have anything to do with, with uh, children who have trouble learning to talk or learning to read? On the whole, children who were struggling to learn to talk, who did not have a hearing impairment, who were not mentally retarded, didn't seem to have anything else wrong with them. Their normal, healthy, happy children seemed to be developing great. They were quite different in the way in which they organized basic non-linguistic signals, complex auditory signals in general. The building blocks in which one would assume you had to put together to come to extract the phonemes of a language really weren't in place for these children. And in particular, they seemed to be having difficulty tracking and integrating brief, rapidly successive um, tones of different frequencies. So they were having difficulty tracking frequency changes that were occurring rapidly in succession. And that's rather critical for language since speech is a series of rapidly successive acoustic changes that have to be tracked and coded and represented. It seems to be a hallmark of many, not all, but many children who are struggling with both oral and written language that they are slow processors. That their brain just needs more time between events to integrate them and track them over time. And um, this became known as the temporal processing um, deficit. Um, temporal was only a part of the problem. It's really a temporal spectral processing problem. That means a difficulty tracking acoustic frequency changes occurring over time. A lot of people who've had, you know, who might have difficulty with this uh, hypothesis or theory would say, well, how does this really work for reading? Because after all, the word is on the page as long as you want to look at it. It's static. Yeah. And they don't really get that what we're talking about is what the brain has to go through. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Now, of course, in the auditory input, that is fleeting. We really have trouble if you have a timing difficulty in the brain. If your brain is processing information more slowly, um, then you're really going to have trouble with ongoing language because it just doesn't wait for you. But once but, you made the discrimination, yeah. there isn't any ambiguity. Right. Whereas right. with the code, there's lots of ambiguity to overcome yes. and yes. assemble while in, and still simulate the real-time flow of... Right, exactly. I mean, the, even if the word is on the page all day long, mm -hmm. um, the neural processes that your brain has to go through are still the same. You have to extract out the ultimately the, the sounds from inside the words and learn to put letters to them. And th if you have represented those sounds in a fuzzy way, if your brain doesn't really clearly hear these very rapid acoustic onsets um, that differentiate um, various speech sounds from each other, then you have represented a, f a much broader um, pattern of neurons firing together. I mean, what we really need is nice, nice, neat, concise, and effective and efficient Wham, you know, that's that sound. It's going to fire and it's going to fire the same pattern every time or a very similar pattern every time. And so then it becomes something that your brain doesn't have to wait to happen. You know, now if you have a broader representation, sometimes it sounds like Bob, but sometimes it sounds like Da, but sometimes it sounds like Ga, which are almost all exactly the same acoustically except for just a tens of milliseconds difference at the onset. Then deciphering out what you've really heard from the context is going to take a lot longer. And therefore, when you come to learn to read, even getting that there are individual sounds inside of words consistently is going to be very difficult. And if your brain has kind of lumped them together, or at least has fuzzy edges between these different boundaries, it's going to be a lot more difficult.
So the building blocks are that there's a distinction, an ability to recognize differences in sound in time mm -hmm. that's, that's important to be able to, in the technology world, they call it mm -hmm. the analog to digital converter, right? Where we're slicing the analog stream mm -hmm. into chunks. Mm -hmm. So if they're not doing that fast enough, mm -hmm. then they don't have the granularity of distinction necessary. Mm -hmm. Then on the other side of that, once they have that, there's a frequency or speed of processing that's necessary to assemble mm -hmm. inside the, the, the mind to create mm -hmm. the virtually heard stream mm -hmm. in the reading process. And that any one of these things can cause a bog in processing that right. causes the stutter that breaks down reading. Right, right. I think, I uh, hope we can put your words in there. <laughs> that sounded perfect. <laughs> that was very good. It seems that uh, apart from the distinction and mm -hmm. processing frequency issues that we're talking about relative to oral language processing. Mm -hmm. That <clears throat> when we talk about reading, we're talking about something else, mm -hmm. which is how all that works in relation to this code. That's right. What, one of the things I'd like to draw out in our conversation now mm -hmm. is the difference as you would perceive it as a neuroscientist who's watching mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. watching the timing <laughs> and so forth, mm -hmm. between the challenge to the brain of reading a phonetic code Mm -hmm. And reading a code that's not phonetic, mm -hmm. or that has a, a, the degree of phonetic ambiguity that the English language does. Mm -hmm. right. What's interesting is that um, different languages mm -hmm. have more or less um, transparent orthographies. Okay. Orthography, of course, is the letter system. Now, it's interesting, in some languages, there's really a one-to-one -one relationship between the letter, and the sound it makes. And English is on the other end of the spectrum, it seems, with lots and lots of exceptions. I mean, who came up with E-N-O-U-G-H spells enough? It should be E-N-U-F, okay? Um, that would be fine. But um, so English has many, many exceptions. And that, of course, adds additional complexities. Reading is one of the more complicated uh, of the higher co cognitive functions using attention and rate of processing and sequencing and memory and the linguistic systems and the visual system and it's having to coordinate this dance that's going on. And the more complicated the translation from the orthography to the phonology is in a particular language, the more complicated this, this processing dance has to be within the brain. And so if these processing rates seem to be so fundamental um, and so uh, highly correlated, both predictive uh, correlations from infancy to childhood and also concurrent correlations throughout life with your uh, phonological abilities, your language abilities, your reading abilities. Then, uh, is it possible to drive these rates of, of processing to make finer and finer distinctions right. in the brain? <laughs> it seemed to me that there would be you two know. fields that this would be applicable. One would be to having a faster frequency so as to be able to make the distinctions in time, mm -hmm. so whatever the variation is right. in what's going on in the world. Right. The second one is to have a higher frequency with which to go through the disambiguation that's involved in assembly, because on the one hand, we've got these distinct elements mm -hmm. which are required. Mm -hmm. but on the other hand, before we get to wherever we're going, we've got to assemble them. That's right, back together. We have to go so back there's... together in some way yeah. in which the if there's ambiguity in the distinctions, it right. has to be processed exactly. through in the assembly. Mm -hmm. So the more that there's ambiguity in between that, the more there's time consumed in working it out, the more. Right. So our approach is to increase the speed of the processing mm -hmm. and wherever possible decrease the unnecessary ambiguity that's overwhelming the process. Right, and that is exactly the same to, a, that is exactly the, you know, coming at the problem from both ends that we've used in the development of Fast Forward. Exactly, you got it, you know, that's exactly what we tried to do, both increase the processing um, capacity um, and also decrease the ambiguity in the signal itself by acoustically altering it so that these rapidly occurring frequency um, changes over time are slowed down and amplified. And then as the individual progresses in the various levels of language and language to reading and reading, one can begin to drop out these additional cues while at the same time having rewired literally the um, processing um, constraints that the kid had to begin with. 